Hello. Hello, Addy. We're doing this again. We're doing doing this again. again. Welcome back to our monthly program, BMA NIMWA. And today's episode is Glamour. (laughs) Thanks for indulging me with a little fan trick. It's the only one I know. Um, (laughs) But we are excited to uh, take a look at three different artists' work today. I'm still Veronica Bettencourt. I still work at the Baltimore Museum of Art. <laughs> Hi, I'm Addie Gayoso, and I'm an educator at the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, DC. Yeah, and um, Addie, why don't you tell us a little bit about glamour? Why are we talking about it? Great question. Why are we talking about it? First of all, we're glamorous, so that's that's start the start. Uh, I think that um, you know we were looking at some of the works in our collections that we wanted to talk about um, as a pairing, and started thinking about this notion of glamour. And to start, we wanted to define that and and better understand sort of what the the sort of dictionary definition is. So I go to my old friend, the old English dictionary, Oxford English dictionary, and there's some really interesting definitions of glamour that were sort of new and surprising to me. And I wanted to read a couple of them to everyone. The first is magic enchantment or spell, especially to, um, in the idea of casting glamour on someone. So this idea that it's sort of magical or um, you know, it's a way of enchanting or tr- almost tricking someone. The other more sort of standard definitions are charm or attractiveness, physical allure, and it's specifically related to sort of feminine beauty. And then a third idea is a magical or fictitious beauty attached to a person or an object, something that's, again, sort of elusive and almost deceptive in some ways. So we were thinking a lot about these definitions and also thinking about ways in which we personally define glamour. Um, we were thinking about about how it's um, really about someone or something that is attractive or alluring to another person. There's also obviously this gendered connotation um, specifically Mm -hmm. related to femininity and and female form. And um, there's also this idea that it can be magical in some ways. And I really like this idea that glamour is not just, it's not just something you put on, Mm -hmm. it's something that is there is an action to it. There is agency to glamour. Glamour is a strategy. It's a tactic. It's something that people do to yield results. You know, folks want to be seen a certain way um, or perceived a certain way. Um, So along those lines, uh, we kind of wanted to take a look at what it is to sort of, you know, put on glamour, Mm -hmm. um, whether that is to kind of create an aspirational sort of image or to express um, your sense of identity um, or to maybe connect to other people. Mm -hmm. Um, So I thought that we might take a look at the work of Micheline Thomas, um, Daniela Rosel, and also Zachary Drucker today, um, three artists who have used glamour in a range of ways um, Mm -hmm. and many different media. media. Uh, So, I think let's start off with a look at Nicolene Thomas's work. And this is coming from the Nimwa collection. Yeah, this is one of actually my favorite works in our collection. It's actually a really small piece. It's about 20 inches by 24 inches. And it's uh, called A-E-I-O-U and Sometimes Why. It was made in 2009. And it's one of McLean Thomas's, uh, it's, it's, familiar to people who know Micheline Thomas's work because it's super shiny. It's um, sort of this Pepto-Bismol pink enamel that sort of has a reflection to it. And then she's bedazzled this portrait of a woman named Fran with uh, probably a million <laughs> different <laughs> black um, rhinestones, which is very common to Micheline Thomas's work, at least her paintings and collages. Uh, and what I think is really beautiful about this piece is that it's a really simplified version of a portrait of someone that McLean Thomas cared very much for. And the other thing I should mention, and we don't have an image of it, but this work is actually part, was part of a larger installation. So this was actually one panel of 40. So imagine this times 40 different images of, of um, African-American women sort of on a large wall. They almost appear like snapshots, just moments. Some of them are laughing, others are gazing directly into our view. So it's this really um, interesting wall of, of, of female 
of females, specifically of of black women who are just sort of presenting themselves um, and their gaze to the viewer. Yeah, well, and I mean, it's, I think the gaze is super important here. And it's something that we really see in a lot of Nicolene Thomas's work um, that women are not just sort of like lying in repose, gazing off to somewhere in the middle distance, like who knows what their thoughts are, who knows who they are as a person. Um, but with Nicolene Thomas, she, there's really a sense of like, this is a distinct individual mm -hmm. and it's an individual who is looking back at you and really needing the idea of being seen. Um, there, there is certainly a sense of agency with her subjects. This is another great example. Uh, Nicolene Thomas works in a variety of mediums and our media, and mm -hmm. um, she's created one of a kind works that we all have seen and loved at various museums, but she also does series of, series of multiples. So almost anyone can own a Nicolene Thomas if they so desire. This is one of uh, the works of, of multiples, and it, this is also in our collection. It's a tote bag, and it was actually a collaboration that that, um, she did with the International Center um, of Photography. They're, the image on the left is one side of the tote and then the image on the right is the other. And they're actually photographs. Uh, so they're sort of standalone works of art that she's used for this bag. So the image on the left is mm -hmm. called Lovely uh, Six Foota. And then the image on the right is Put Something Down on It. So those are the titles of those two individual photographs that she's incorporated mm -hmm. in this work. And I'm actually going to take us both just to audio only. So all the folks who want a closer look, this yeah. is uh, this is when we're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So here we have, um, you know, as close as we can get to a detail shot in our, mm -hmm. our digital universe. Um, but I really want to take a closer look at not just these women who are in poses that are, you know, they're models. Yeah. Um, they are absolutely aware of how to place their body, how they are kind of presenting themselves. Um, the woman at the right is, you know, looking back over her shoulder, like, yeah, this is me and I'm here. Um, and we get that similar sort of sense of a direct gaze with the woman at the left. I also really love uh, looking at the environment mm -hmm. that Nicolene Thomas has built. Um, for these women. And I think it really sort of speaks to the fact that she was trained as a painter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are, these are sets. Um, and this really feels like uh, she's kind of built out this Nicolene Thomas world. Absolutely. I think, you know, and some of it, it rings very nostalgic for probably a lot of our viewers, right? We have this really interesting sort of wood paneled wall. We have these sort of shag carpets in certain colors that remind us, I mean, maybe this is dating me, but I mean, I think about shag carpet from the, the 70s when I was born and I the, the, that carpet looks very familiar to me. <laughs> and all of these really interesting patterns as well, which I think is, is very um, representative of Micheline Thomas's interest in collage and sort of creating layers of, of textures, visual textures, and as well as patterns. Yeah, and I kind of want to take us uh, from Nimwa and the tote bags mm -hmm. into a place where Micheline Thomas's sort of full scope of, let's say, site-specific imagination mm -hmm. uh, really takes force. Um, and that's at the Baltimore Museum of Art, where... Um, she has uh, created, she is the inaugural artist for the Meyer Hofbecker uh, Commission um, for the lobby. And as you can see from what we're looking at, she took the lobby and really expanded her concept. So from the front of the building, she's uh, taken vinyl and created uh, the look of three Baltimore row houses, um, one in brick, one in you know vinyl siding, and one on the right uh, in form stone. Um, so, I feel like even though this maybe doesn't look glamorous, and I'm doing air quotes here, <laughs> uh, in terms of like, you know, the high fashion modeling, really sort of uh, glitzy look, like this is, I think, kind of a form of glamour and that she's putting a, a new face on the museum. I really love that this speaks so much to specifically to sort of Baltimore architecture, right? We have those stoops. You talked about that. You mm -hmm. call it form stone, right? Which is really specific yeah. to Baltimore. I feel like the only yeah. thing we may be missing is some some painted screens, but it really speaks. <laughs> 
right? It really speaks Baltimore. And yeah. I think what's really cool about this, and we'll see it in the next few images, is that McLean Thomas is interested in sort of recasting uh, what traditional portraiture was, right? She's trying to redefine beauty. And it's not just about sort of this the dominant narrative of what beauty is. And so she's doing that in her portraiture and in, in her representations and in the models she's choosing. But she's also a sort of re- she's asking us to reconsider what a museum space is too, right? It's not just about um, looking at portraiture differently, but really looking at the space in which we convene to yeah. appreciate art. And I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, John Russell Pope, who was the architect for the original building, the neoclassical one, talked about the BMA as being um, the front porch of the museum. Um, and Mickalene Thomas has really taken that idea. And as you can see, she's made of Baltimore's living room. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this massive couch uh, that is uh, you know, placed in vinyl across the wall. Uh, you can sort of see in the corner that she's made almost this like 70s, 80s Fantasia period room mm -hmm. um, where she's taken all of her you know, bright colors and patterns um, and multiple different flooring types and made kind of this little set environment um, where it's hard to tell, but she's placed some of her own um, photographs uh, in the background. And then also, uh, if you continue, she's created this inner um, gallery space uh, where uh, different Baltimore and Baltimore affiliated artists um, works is on view. Um, and you can see that like, this is a gallery that is very much a domestic space. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like, a rumpus room. <laughs> it's, it's got that, you know, the cool bar that maybe like your parents, like friends had in their basement. Um, it's, uh, it's also got all of these like cozy chairs. Um, on the other side of the space, uh, there's a large screen uh, where different video works by Baltimore artists are on view. Um, and she's also like left stacks of books and magazines all throughout um, and so I think here we see glamour in terms of um, kind of building out an environment. Mm -hmm. Like it's really, it's the backdrop where I think people are invited to become glamorous, to sort of think of themselves in relationship to the space that, that they're in. You know, like I don't, I think this feels really different than being in a marble walled museum. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that she's inviting people to think of themselves and their own sort of belonging within a museum space differently. Um, and I, I think that's like part of the glamour of it. Yeah, I also, I, mean, I think you touched on this, but I, it, I'm just so drawn to it because it makes me feel that she's sort of inviting me not only to this, it's a very cozy and welcoming space, right? So I'm sort of drawn to it for those reasons, but it also makes me feel like I will be sort of the subject of her work of art. I'm like, yes. I would love to be a subject of her work. <laughs> uh, the way that she represents uh, women and um, just, you know, celebrates beauty um, and glamour in, in her work. I just, it's like the idea of being a part of that is really pretty cool. I'm curious is, are the magazine, what sort of, what is, she, you mentioned that she's populated the space with like popular culture. And yeah. for those of you who are not familiar with McLean Thomas, um, she's particular, she's pulling from a variety of sources, art historical sources, certainly, but she's also pulling from popular culture like Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering sort of what ephemera is in that space. So there is some of that, like, you know, the, um, I think we have some issues of uh, Jet Magazine in there. I know mm -hmm. that the team, the studio team went to local thrift stores um, to source both, you know, decor and also books. Um, so it's really kind of building out the material and visual culture that she grew up with. Mm -hmm. um, and also that, you know, she was really a part of because her mother um, was a model. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... So I think that this kind of looking at um, different ways that glamour is something that people personally adopt, but also as a professional um, mm -hmm. kind of strategy, like I think that you can see that at work in the way that Nicolene Thomas has kind of pulled this installation together. I'm really glad you mentioned her her mother because she was a model in her own right. And she actually became a muse for Nicolene Thomas while she was alive. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, speaking of glamour, um, there's this great quote that I found that Thomas said about her mom. She said that she was a fierce human being, such magnetism and energy. Even when she was sick, you saw her, she looked good. She got made up. She wanted to present herself. That was the strength she always carried. I thought that was a really cool mm -hmm. sort of connection and to this, this idea of glamour and that her mother, even mm -hmm. when she was um, dying uh, of an illness, she always wanted to sort of look the part and present herself. And in some ways that made her feel better, <laughs> which I think is really interesting. Yeah. 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 And sort of glamour is something that people choose as a form of, uh, of strength, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting. Um, I also think it's significant that Nicolene Thomas, um, and here I'm going to kind of pull in a quote that you found, Addie, so credit <laughs> cards do, uh, where Nicolene Thomas has said that, uh, I believe the sitter has the power over what's being presented. I'm not overly choreographing them. Um, and so I think that idea is really significant uh, as we look at our next artist, mm -hmm. uh, um, who took a similar approach by inviting each sitter of her Ricas y Famosas series um, to pick where they were posed, to pick their expression, to pick the things around them. Um, and Daniel Rosel is a Mexican um, artist mm -hmm. who said of her series that, uh, and this is a quote, the images depict actual settings. The photographic subjects are representing themselves. Any resemblance, any resemblance to real world events is not coincidental. So with that, I think I'm going to take us from Baltimore yeah. to uh, the <laughs> to <Mexico. laughs> glorified air of uh, the hyper wealthy in Mexico City. Yeah, that, so the works that we're gonna look at next are actually part of the museum's collection and they're part of a larger series, Ricas y Famosas, which uh, became a book pr um, published that um, Daniela Russell took about 89 photographs. So we have four in our collection and they're actually quite large. Uh, I was thinking a little bit about the contrast. So the Micheline Thomas that we have, that beautiful Pepto-Bismol pink um, portrait of Fran is quite small and intimate. You get can really get close to it. Uh, these works are about 50 by 60 inches. So they're quite large. They're quite, um, they're photographs that are very, very sort of shiny and um, yeah, they're like size. Good. Yes, exactly. They're huge. So um, this particular series, just a little bit more about Daniela Rossell. She was, she is from an elite class in Mexico. I, I call it like Mexicans, like the Mexico's 1%, right? So she actually, several of her grandfathers were governors in Mexico. Um, her mother was an art collector. She comes from a very well-to-do family and she decided she wanted to do a series of portraits of women, uh, primarily women, within this social circle. And as um, Veronica mentioned, they've chosen their settings, they've chosen the way they wish to be presented. Uh, but it, 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 these images provide some interesting uh, dichotomies and um, a little bit of discomfort, at least as a, for me as a viewer. There's, there's a lot to look at. <laughs> There's always something a little bit off or disquieting about these works, um, but these certainly are about these portraits are certainly about these women representing themselves as glamorous and as as they feel like they should present themselves um, through, yeah. you know, they, they talk a lot, she, the artist talks a lot about how popular culture she feels really influenced the way these women presented themselves. And this example yeah. is uh, called Michelle Jacuzzi. And this is one of the only of this series that I've seen um, the subject outside of a domestic space. Um, and we'll take a look at another one that actually shows that um, a figure inside. But I'm curious um, what you're thinking about this one, Veronica. Boy, I mean, there <laughs> is just, um, it's such a dramatic photograph. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really interesting to think about the environment here compared to the environment of Nicolene Thomas. Um, because even though, you know, this is, um, Michelle sitting in a jacuzzi uh, overlooking um, sort of central Mexico City. I'm 90% sure that the green space that we see uh, toward the bottom left is uh, El Bosque Chapultepec or Chapultepec Park, um, which is surrounded by some really tony, um, very wealthy neighborhoods in Mexico City. So to have this kind of unbroken view over one of the biggest cities in the Western Hemisphere um, like there's just this real sense of both place and expansiveness and dominion and to have mm. this 
pass mm-hmm. that's just intersecting with her gaze that's kind like she's casting it over her shoulder. I mean, that's just, it's all about her um, in this incredibly dramatic environment. Um, You're talking about her gaze, which I find sort of somewhat bizarre and unnatural. I think I was talking about the sort of disquieting elements of these works by Russell. And there's either something to me in every one of these images, whether it be an object or sort of what feels like an awkward pose that really like gives me pause. And what's interesting to me is I was actually thinking about the tote that we just looked at by Thomas and um, the this the image of the woman sort of peering fr- at us from sort of, we see her, her rear end and then she's looking mm-hmm. back. For some reason that pose feels more natural than this one. And I'm not sure exactly why that is, but I think that there's a, a a confluence of things going on here. It's really hard to escape for me what seems to be sort of religious, um, symbolism like we ha- she's wearing this sort of you call it a bandolier which I think is great it's sort of like yeah. a sash but what it is is it's just like this enormously it, it it's this huge it's rosary, massive rosary. right <laughs> right and it's sort of juxtaposed with a a tattoo on her lower back um which has a certain term at least <laughs> in our culture and um you know and for me there's this this weird mix between the sacred and the sexual here um you know, she's wearing all white, but it's maybe hard to tell, but she seems like underneath that sort of gossamer skirt, she's wearing a black thong. Um, mm-hmm. There, you know, and I'm thinking too, even just about the the color choices, um, which this is a photograph, but I see, you know, the blue sky is really, um, really evident. And then we have these red tones that sort of dot the landscape. And I'm thinking a lot about sort of this notion of religious imagery of like the Madonna, for instance, with the the rich blues and the reds. And then mm-hmm. there's this, this other side of this, which is re- this very sort of feeling like this is sort of this hyper-sexualized figure. Um, and I, to put a, to provide a little bit of context, um, Green Naftali, which is a gallery that's shown Rossell's work, mentions this particular this particular photograph as Michelle being on um, a penthouse roof of a pimp. And so I'm not sure. I'm very curious about her relationship with this sort of upper class in Mexico City and her relationship with this individual who may own this property. But there's a lot of complex things going on here in terms of sexuality, glamour, as well as these notions of of the sacred in a way. Yeah. Well, and I think it's... um... I think it's interesting to think about her in a space that maybe doesn't belong to her Mm -hmm. um, or where she is a visitor. Um, Because one of the things that was really important for a lot of the women that Rosette photographed is that they got to pick where they were um, portrayed. So with our our next picture, um, this is, it's a dramatically different setting. You know, we are inside of a woman's home. Um, and I think, you know, there's a, you know, this a sort of interesting contrast here um, in that this is, I think it has the same feeling of being staged, but like you can just see the mechanics of staging were so much greater. Um, it wasn't just somebody sitting down on a jacuzzi and sort of thinking about how to, how to pose their body. Um, there's real like production work here. Absolutely. <laughs> the hair. I mean, I wonder how long that took just to arrange her hair and those sort of perfect sort of Medusa like curls. Right. And this work um, is yeah. referred to as Medusa actually, but yeah, there's certainly this layer of production that's occurred here. And I think to compare this or actually contrast this to McLean Thomas's work a little bit, I think where we were talking about how, about how McLean Thomas was really interested in redefining what portraiture is in a lot of ways, what Russell is doing is reinforcing traditional portraiture, right? Um, this is a very interesting pose certainly, but there is a level mm-hmm. um, in all of her works of, like you said, production. And there's certainly a level of a high level of of decision making on the part of the sitter. How do I want to be presented? What objects do I want near and around me to represent my wealth or my status? And so I think she's really doing that in a in maybe a less traditional uh, medium. Typically, we think of portraits as being paintings, but in this case, she's creating these individual photos of 
of subjects uh, in, in ways that they want to be perceived by the rest of the world. Yeah. What, well, and I think that yeah. that's something that's really important to note that all of the women who were portrayed in this Ricas y Famosa series, you know, they they decided mm -hmm. to be in the project because they'd seen other women, women who were their peers. Um, and Rosette talks about how, you know, a woman would see the photograph that Rosette had taken of somebody else and think like, oh, she looks good. You know, I want to look good too. Um, and so there is um, this real kind of agency in terms of the sitter determining a lot of the photograph. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really interesting how here, Rosel um, does something that she does not infrequently, which is to include kind of the traces of herself mm -hmm. as the photographer. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. In a, yeah. In a lot of her works, it, it is a bit hard to see, but at the very, very top of the composition, um, sort of just above the woman's head and hair, we see two uh, sort of sticks, white sticks that are coming down. That's actually part of the artist's tripod. And it seems like there's a, we see a shoe or a foot there as well. So I think in a lot of respects, Russell is incorporating herself into her works as it's, I, I like to call it sort of her signature in a way or her own mm -hmm. self portrait. And it's almost a way for her to, to acknowledge that there's, um, it's an acknowledgement of uh, the fact that we're viewing, right? That we've we are voyeurs. Um, we're sort yeah. of part of the scene. So I think these reflections serve that purpose certainly to show us the artist. It was really hard to tell, but if you see Michelle Jacuzzi in person, there um, that there's sort of a, a glass panel that surrounds her, um, and that sort of is like a balcony for the penthouse. And there's actually a reflection of Russell in that work as well. You can see her mm -hmm. tripod again. You can see her feet. It's really hard to tell unless you see it in person. I'm, Other I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try going back once. Yeah. And maybe we can find yeah, it. it it's pretty hard to tell. It's down sort of in the area what you were mentioning that sort of that green space there. So it's probably mm -hmm. hard for us to see digitally or virtually, but um, yeah. it's there's definitely evidence of her as well. And I think reflect the reflections in her work do some other things too. They often are reflecting objects. So they're almost, they're like mirroring and duplicating these objects. Mm -hmm. Many of these rooms that she's photographed in are rife with things, right? There are a million and one yeah. objects. Many of them seem expensive. Um, and so that those mirrors then reflect that and multiply it and almost suggest excess. And I think again, we're really- I don't think they just suggest excess, Addie, they are excess. <laughs> it's excess of excess, right? It's it's <laughs> all of the things times two. Yeah. And it's and all stuff on stuff on stuff. Right, <laughs> want more things. And it's also really forcing us, like I said earlier, to, to really think about our role as a voyeur in this, right? That we see a reflection of this person. Uh, we are sort of put in a position to be reminded that we are looking and we are in some cases judging. And actually the this series of works was really, was judged quite harshly when they were taken as a whole. Uh, these these uh, women who were portrayed um, were, were called sort of the, the poster, the poster girls of corruption. And I didn't mention earlier, but many of them are members or associated with the ruling dominant party in Mexico, or at least the what had been the dominant party at the time from like 1929 to um, 2000 or the early 2000s. So um, I think part of it certainly has a political slant as well. And it really affected the way these women were viewed. And R Daniela Russell actually got a lot of flack for this series. She had, there were threats. Um, against her. So it, it, it taken in mass, I think they were super problematic. Um, but to sort of move on, because I know we want to talk about Zachary Drucker and her work is yeah. particularly interesting. Um, you know, I, th I think that these reflections in Russell are really a great segue for our next works. And I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Well, I think, um, you know, these reflections are not just situating the artist in the work and kind of functioning as a bit of a self-portrait. Um, they also kind of call into, talk, call into our attention that glamour is something that is made mm -hmm. and that you, know, you sort of check yourself in the mirror um, before you proceed into um, kind of thinking about how your glamour is going to be seen by others. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
Zachary Drucker uh, is, and here you can, we have two women in frame. Um, we have Zachary Drucker and you can see her uh, in the kind of the, the reflection of maybe it's a mirror, maybe it's a, a glass, I think it's a mirror, um, but there's a, there's a lot of reflections mm -hmm. in glass sort of going on here. Um, so you can see Zachary Drucker sort of in that background. And then in the foreground is her mentor, Rosalind Blumenstein. Um, who has been one of the pioneering figures of uh, advocacy for uh, trans folks um, and for trans rights. Um, so Rosalind Blumenstein uh, is a licensed clinical social worker, um, but also was an activist uh, for many years. So we're kind of moving from the uh, rarefied interiors of mm -hmm. Mexico City apartments into Los Angeles. Um, which is where uh, both Drucker and Blumenstein uh, live. And it's interesting to think about sort of um, these women uh, in LA, which Drucker has called, quote, the land of industrialized fantasy. Mm. Um, so I think that, you know, we're very aware here, and Drucker's very aware of the way that glamour is um, so much a part of you know, not just the, the movie industry and the TV industry, which Drucker is also a part of. She's been a producer on Transparent. Um, she's a consultant for other film and, uh, you know, media projects. Um, but, you know, there's a real sense of, of the camera here, of the camera as something that people live with mm -hmm. every day. Um, and, and, and also, to, and, not just the camera, just but the even... Camera the mirror as sort of this way of sort of seeing ourselves and reflecting. It makes me think actually, sorry to sort of go down this art historical path, but all of these works, <laughs> here for I, know, talking about art. I know, but all of these works have been making me think a lot about um, John Berger's comments about women um, sort of being seen. And that's sort of almost a lot in life for women is that we're sort of, we're, we're, we don't just see ourselves, but we're very aware of the act of being seen. Um, and so I think this idea of, of these two figures being um, behind, you know, in front of the camera, in front of a mirror, sort of layers all of these notions of being of being seen, and yeah. and you in um, this idea too of of age. I know being in Hollywood, this idea of of youth as sort of youth and glamour together as sort of the 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 holy grail, right? And Roz does talk about sort of age being a factor yeah. too, and sort of being seen as an older woman mm -hmm. in that space too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we um, the BMA had a conversation uh, in June that you can check out online um, between Zachary Drucker and Rosalind Blumenstein, as well as um, Alan Fran and uh, Leslie Cozy. Um, and Ros Blumenstein, one of the things that she said that stuck out to me is, you know, in looking at these photographs of herself, she said, uh, it's an interesting place being an older woman and really having spent so much time, so much energy in your life utilizing the way you look as a defense mechanism mm -hmm. against the world. Um, and I think that that is a really interesting idea um, about glamour and kind of self-presentation mm -hmm. as a mechanism of defense mm -hmm. um, in that like you really are thinking about being seen um, and making very deliberate decisions about how your appearance is going to uh, kind of register to other people. That's a really interesting idea. I, it sort of took me on this path of thinking about how um, certain certain insects and birds sort of resemble other creatures in order to, as a defense oh, mechanism, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Right, it's sort of like um, this mimic <laughs> yeah. that exists. Um, uh -huh. But I think what's really interesting too about Drucker's work is that we're seeing not just one singular image of these women, like we did with Rissell, but we're actually seeing, seeing this sort of series of images. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really plays into this idea of, of feeling like we're, we're more a part of this intimate space and we've been invited into it. And Rissell has a single image of most of her subjects, right? So that's sort of the definitive image. Uh, but with Drucker, she's really welcoming in us into a space that's, that's quite intimate and um, allowing yeah. us to see sort of almost an evolution or um, a metamorphosis of some kind as she's preparing to, to, to be, to go out, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that idea of invitation and relationship that we get to see over the course of the series, um, 
you know, it, it sort of comes across in that these pictures of Blumenstein were taken uh, last year in 2019. Um, and, you know, the one that we just saw uh, <laughs> was called Lady Lady. This is called Lady Gaze. Um, and it's a very different presentation of Blumenstein. Um, but she's still, you know, in her apartment. Um, but now, you know, as she, uh, as she thanked Drucker, like Drucker came in with a uh, makeup artist and lights and, you know, great production value um, and really sort of satisfied some of her desires in, as she, in her own words, those of being a very vain woman. Um, so, so yeah, so we, I think I like this, um, I don't know, it feels like a sort of like an implicit narrative or invitation to be with Drucker and Blumenstein as they're getting ready, as they're setting up the shot. And then here we have like the shot. Um, it really is so, so dramatic with these really saturated like magenta and cobalt kind of tones in the light. Um, and with Blumenstein just taking up space, mm -hmm. I mean, her hair is just, it's really dramatic. It's almost like a sculptural element. So, uh, this is a, one of my, like of all the images we've talked about, this is one of my favorites. It's absolutely beautiful. Like you said, I think the, the saturated colors really add to sort of the, the interest and that hair, I love it. And it reminds me of our Medusa. So it's a great, <laughs> like it's a really great pairing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it is. And it's, um, I think it's really interesting to think about the Medusa by Rosset in comparison with this portrait of Blumenstein by Drucker. Um, because I think part of what makes them feel different to me is that here, uh, maybe because Blumenstein is isolated from her environment, it's mm. just her. Um, you sort of have to take her on her own terms. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we're looking at the Rosetta, there's so much other stuff around um, that we're not just reading the women um, as sort of independent beings, but we're also seeing the women with all of their stuff. And like that really makes a big difference because you start to like, you know, take a look at the, uh, the fact that there was maybe a prize winning basket that had a like a doll in it on the bed with Medusa. Right, the um, creepy doll. That, that's the creepy part of that photo for me, right? Like I mentioned there's something creepy and disquieting about every Russell image. And yes, that that very odd like doll. I think to your point of uh you know this this sort of we are engaging with this one individual. She is looking directly at us. We have her gaze. She has ours and she is devoid of of place is really important. And I think Roussel, part of her, though her subjects chose where they wanted to be depicted, they often chose these sort of very, um, very filled spaces with lots of objects. And in a way, Roussel talked about how that is, it just makes the, the women in that space like one more object. They're just part of this sort of setting mm -hmm. that feels very much like they are not individuals. They don't have their own agency. They're just sort of another prop in this this dom domestic space that they've created. And, um, and for her, that sort of references uh, objectification of women in mass culture and mass media. So I think it's, it's a really interesting contrast that we're seeing here. We're not mm -hmm. just taking the women uh, for who they are in a moment and what they look like and what they're wearing. We have to sort of absorb that along with all of those other trappings of, of success, of, of, of wealth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but I also think that throughout um, throughout all of the works that we've seen, you know, whether by Nicole Thomas or the New Yorker or Zachary Drucker, all of them have talked about their relationship with their sitter um, as being one where the, the person whose portrait is being made um, has a lot of agency and a lot of like, let's say directorial choice mm -hmm. in terms of how they're portrayed. Like with Blumenstein, um, uh, Drucker actually credits her with coming up with a lot of the ideas for the photograph. Um, in Drucker's words, because she's brilliant and has an expansive imagination. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, this is Blumenstein inviting Drucker and, uh, you know, via Drucker inviting us into the way that she is creating a world for herself in her mm -hmm. apartment, um, which I think is really, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting to see how we go from these uh, 
more like maybe I don't know. I don't know if it's fair to say realistic, but just these moments that feel a little bit more grounded in daily life versus the like elevation of full glamour uh, that we see mm -hmm. with yeah. the lady gaze uh, photograph. So, um, love it. Love these works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I'm going to maybe finish with some some words from uh, Rosalind Blumenstein about her uh, pictures, which mm. is, you know, those pictures aren't that glamorous. That's how I wake up in the morning. Um, so, <laughs> so jealous. <laughs> no. but, um, yeah, so I'm gonna try bringing us back in uh, and let's see if we can maybe address some of the uh, questions sure. and comments that have come through. So um, here's an even easy one. Jennifer Hawkins Hawk wants to know, will this be available for replay? Wonderful top and presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. I am flattered and yes, this will be available for replay. Uh, we record it and then post it on both of our Facebook pages for NIMWA and the BMA, as well as um, on YouTube for the BMA. Um, let's see. Uh, Christina Wadler asks about uh, Michelle Jacuzzi and mm -hmm. what is the tattoo? It's difficult to see. Yeah, I, I, I wish I, I had mean, an answer I mean, for that. It's, I don't, I don't have an answer to that. Unfortunately, it's, it's definitely even in person, it's a bit hard to make out. It feels almost like a symbol of some kind. It doesn't seem um, like writing, but I, I don't know. It's a great question. I mean, I guess this is just, um, I think, Addy, NIMWA is open to the public. Uh, it is indeed. We, yeah, yeah, we reopened on August 1st. Um, and actually, the um, Medusa is on view. Oh. And we are selling time. We're encouraging folks to buy tickets in advance. You can sell, you can buy time tickets on um, through our website, um, NIMWA.org. So if you are so inclined, um, we are taking extra precautions to make sure it's a safe um, environment for, for our visitors. And we're only limiting, we're limiting visitorship to a very small number. So it would be a great opportunity to sort of have an intimate engagement with our works on view. So please visit if you're in the DC area. Yeah, no, that's great. And it's great to know that the one of the Riverside photographs is on view so you can really kind of get the whole magnitude. Yes, and, and the, yeah. the Thomas is also on view, the A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y. So yes. um, you can see both of those if you visit. And um, if you swing by the BMA, right now our sculpture garden is open and we also have a new um, outdoor digital tour that you can do using Go Mobile. Um, and it includes a stop on the Nicolene Thomas, a moment's pleasure uh, installation. And um, actually the pictures that I have of the exterior of the building are actually a little bit outdated um, because Nicolene Thomas has updated the project uh, to include two banners um, that express uh, support for Black Lives Matter. So, That's you so can, cool. um, yeah, you can come see those um, and then, you know, uh, enjoy other things uh, along the outside of the BMA campus. Very cool. Um, and uh, I want to apologize that Addie is not on screen right now. Um, for some reason, I can hear yeah. her, but I can't see her. So I'm here. There. I'm here. I promise. <laughs> it's yeah. maybe because I'm holding a big black piece of paper over my face. Is that why? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I am here, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. We have. Um, some comments from Molly Q. Coleman, uh, who says, we are very aware of, you know, quote, the act of being seen and almost asking for permission to be seen as who we are and not as the media portrays the idealistic view of, quote, the woman. Um, which I think, yeah, is maybe yeah. like calling back to our, uh, not just our John Berger reference from earlier in the program, but um, mm -hmm. also the entire, the entire fact of glamour, like glamour exists because you have a sense of yourself and how you want to be seen. Mm -hmm. It's very much about that relationship and that kind of negotiation of um, what do you do to sort of either transform or maybe realistically portray yourself. Um, I also think you know, we had an interesting conversation when we were preparing for this about sort of 
why this topic now and what is glamour? How maybe yeah. has glamour changed or been redefined given that we're all social distancing and not seeing one another as often? And mm -hmm. um, and so I think there is, you know, it, for me, it's, it's changed a lot. I, I think just personally, anecdotally, I, I never saw myself as as glamorous. I never, even when I dress up for a special occasion, um, it, it never sort of occurred to me that, that that's a term that I would use to describe myself. But I think um, now that I'm not being seen by many people, there are moments where I want to feel magical and glamorous. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I was telling Veronica the other day, I, I bought a dress. Do I need a dress right now? Probably not. I have a zillion in my closet that I haven't worn. But for some reason, putting on that turquoise dress made me feel really special and um, beautiful. And that was all for me because really no one else saw me. So I think um, even, you know, given our current circumstances, how we're defining glamour um, is evolving, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think things like, you know, the entire fashion industry has associated itself very closely with glamour. I mean, we have a magazine called Glamour. <laughs> um, and right now we're seeing, you know, the fashion industry totally, totally rethink mm -hmm. um, its very viability yep. um, because we're not going out, we're not purchasing clothes in the same way because there isn't the same kind of pressure of seeing and being seen mm -hmm. um, that maybe existed previously when you know folks' social lives were a lot more public. Mm -hmm. um, and now our social lives like exist from kind of in a in a in a portrait of a like a bust portrait. You know, really <laughs> like nobody has a body below the waist. Um, <gasps> Oh, and to that point, you know, there yeah. are always, right? Like I'm thinking about, so we all are sort of portraits right now, like when we're co communicating with one another and we're creating yeah. our look, we're also like deciding what objects we want other people to see. I mean, aren't there yeah. all these great um, sort of rate my room <laughs> sort of like um, ideas mm -hmm. about sort of how we're, I just was thinking a bit more about the Russell and sort of the objects people have surrounded themselves with to be seen. And we're not we're not far from that. We're very much doing the same thing through, point, yeah. Yeah, through this, yeah. this particular sort of environment. The environment so that people know yeah. about us via what they can see through this little exactly. you know, the Zoom box. Exactly. Um, well, so, uh, this has been a lovely conversation with you, Addie. Thank you. Oh, thank for you. Us. Um, this is BMA Nimwa. The episode was Glamour. And you can join us again uh, next month, also known as September, for those of you who are keeping track of time, <laughs> uh, when we'll have another conversation about a theme that uh, celebrates uh, women artists uh, across both collections. So thank you so much. Thank you and, for being uh, here. Thanks so much. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.